Catherine Mace. I'm a past president of the Historical Society, and I want to welcome you to come, you know, for a Saturday. All the things that Paul said, it is a beautiful day out there. And I did come in after digging in the dirt. I don't know that you want to see my hands. Anyway, the, uh, <laughs> sto <laughs> the stories that Paul tells are really fun stories. And he has been helpful with the Historical Society another time. I don't know if any of you went on our old uh, Voices from the Past. We did walking tours in Old Town, and he helped us with that program. Helped us uh, do the writing on that and research and how to do this sort of thing. And, and yeah, it was Mr. Monroe. Oh, that's right. I was. Yes. I was Mr. He, he, Monroe. he was one of my relatives. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. We're yeah. family. Yeah, we're family. Okay. Paul Woodland. Oh. <laughs> Save your strength. It's hot out. I want you to get tired clapping right away. <coughs> All right, so yeah, I'm Paul Woodland. I'm a traditional storyteller. I'm a practitioner of the oral tradition. And I've been storytelling for over 25 years now. Stories seem to find me. They just do. I, I'm not sure why that is or how that is. I think I'm just lucky that way. And I. I was born with the gift of gab, and it just was sort of a natural thing that they went together. I had the capacity to speak often, and sometimes well, and I find stories all the time. Or they find me, I'm not sure which. Uh, just this week, I was down in San Francisco, and uh, we went down to see Tom Jones. You know, what's new, pussycat, Tom Jones? <coughs> That's not unusual, and all that sort of thing. He's still alive. <laughs> 77 years old and he knocked it out of the park folks he was amazing he was truly remarkable anyways down there in San Francisco Knob Hill we're staying at the top of the mark right Mark Hopkins Hotel living it up I was born in the city and I thought I'd never been there never been in that building I could never afford it <laughs> so uh, now that I'm a wealthy storyteller I can travel the world <laughs> And so I went back home to San Francisco, and we're staying at the Mark Hopkins. And so we're wandering around, excited about the show that night. And we're down in Union Square, looking at all the rich people buy things. And then we went into the financial district, and we came along 111 Sutter. Big, beautiful old building. I thought, let's go in and find out a little bit about this building. So I go in there, and this beautiful lobby, ornate. And there's this guy in a suit, and he's all official looking. He goes, can I help you? So well, just kind of curious about the building. Uh, you know, when was it built, and why was it built? What used to be here, you know? He says, well, there's a little museum inside. Go take a look. So I go in there, and first thing I see is it used to be the first Wells Fargo Bank. I thought, well, that's kind of cool, the very first Wells Fargo Bank. And I happen to know from... California folklore that uh, Black Bart lived very close to that location and he had an affinity for Wells Fargo. <laughs> <laughs> he robbed him 28 times, he did. <laughs> yeah, so anyway, so I thought, oh, that's kind of cool. I like that. And then I, I go down and, uh, well, Dashiell Hammett used to roam around there in San Francisco. And of course, Sam Spade, the great detective that he wrote about, his office is 111 Sutter right in that building. I thought, well, that's way cool. I dig Dashiell Hammett and Sam Spade. That's really cool. I go down to the next photo, and there's a picture of the cast of, of One Man's Family, a very popular radio program in the 40s and 50s, the longest running radio show in history of radio. And there's a picture of the cast, One Man's Family. So I, I Go to the show that night, and the next day I go home to visit my mother. She's 92, be 93 next month. And I said, Mom, I was in 111 Sutter. And they had the studio there where your favorite radio show, One Man's Family, used to air. And she goes, oh, I love that show. She goes, did you know that you and your sister were named after characters in that radio show? <laughs> And it's true that the oldest son in the family was Paul, and his sister was Claudia, and that's my sister's name. I got named after a radio show character. <laughs> and I was in the building where they recorded it. I thought, see, stories just follow me everywhere I go. 
So, when I moved to Humboldt County, it was in 1996. It was the summer, and a day just like this, sunny and warm. And I brought everything I owned to Humboldt County. I had loaded it in a van, I had a trailer behind me, and up I come to Arcata. I got a little mother-in-law unit that's just about four blocks from the university. I'm going to be a student there. I unload the van and the trailer, and when I'm done, I'm, I'm perspiring, and it's hot out. And I think, I'm going to go for a swim and cool off. <laughs> now, I know the ocean's cold. I, I grew up in Northern California. But I saw a sign that said, Blue Lake. <laughs> so I'm going to the lake for a swim. I get in the van, I get on Highway 101, I go north on the freeway, take the 299 exit, I have a few miles up to the town of Blue Lake. I drive around all over the place. I can't find a lake anywhere. I found the river though, I found the Mad River, and I thought, that'll work. I go for a swim in the river. And when I'm done, I'm, I'm kind of thirsty and a little bit hungry, and I thought, I'll stop in town and get something to eat and drink. Well, the only thing I could find was the Loggers Bar, and they were open. So I went on in, and I got myself some refreshments. And I'm sitting at the bar, and I said to the bartender, why do they call this town Blue Lake? It doesn't have a lake. He said, well, we used to. I said, yeah. <laughs> you see, yeah, there's a picture of it right over there. <laughs> so, okay, I go over and I look, and sure enough, there's a picture of Blue Lake. There's people fishing, and, and there's somebody out in a canoe in there. And I thought, okay, I see the picture. <laughs> Where did it go? I mean, it didn't just get up and walk away now, did it? He said, oh, no, nothing like that. I said, but it was a long time ago. He said, it was late fall, early winter. And a flock of geese were migrating south, and they stopped at Blue Lake to, to rest and refuel. And while they were paddling around on the lake, temperature dropped suddenly, and the lake froze solid. And those poor geese were just stuck in the lake. Their, their, their little feet stuck in the ice there. They couldn't move. They just flapped their wings. And finally, in unison, they raise up. <laughs> With blue lakes stuck to their feet. <laughs> and they just kept traveling south. <laughs> And they took Blue Lake with them. <laughs> and when he told me that, I said, I've come to the right place. <laughs> so that was my introduction to Humboldt County and uh, to the folklore of the region. And I've been spreading that story for a long time. Some of you have probably heard me tell that one before, but uh, I don't get tired of it, that's for sure. And it gets more and more true the more I tell it. <laughs> And that's sort of the, the joy of storytelling. So what I am going to do is I'm going to sort of tell you a, a variety of types of tales that I have stumbled upon in my travels around Humboldt County and, and my journey to get here. And this next one is, is actually a, a story that I used to tell on the radio. I have a, well, I used to have a, a radio program on KHSU called the Whippy Dip Radio Show. And uh, they just took me off the air recently, which kind of bummed me out. But anyways, I know, I don't understand these things. But anyways, I used to do this radio show. And I started in radio in Humboldt County uh, 21 years ago. I was at KRFH first, a student-run station. Radio Free Humboldt was their uh, little slogan. And I started doing storytelling on the radio. And our mentor it was uh, Dr. Melton. He was the professor in the department. And he said, you know, you're the only one that is using this format to talk. You're telling stories, and then you play songs that go with the stories. He goes, it's brilliant. It's a really good idea. You ought to take that to public radio. There's a place for it. And I said, I'm just learning how to do radio, Dr. Melton. I, I, don't, I don't have a clue what I'm doing. He goes, keep working it. I'm going to talk to KHSU. And he did. He hooked me up. I got actually hired to work there. And I had the morning shift. I, I was the local host of Morning Edition back in the days when Bob Edwards was doing it. And then I got this radio show. I did a volunteer radio show. And I started telling stories and playing songs. 
And so I'm going to give you a little example of how I did that, how I put a story and a song together. And this is one that I used to do on the radio frequently. Now, I tell stories at a place called Olima, California, which is right near the Point Reyes National Seashore. And it's a RV campground. Now, Olima, long ago, was a stagecoach stop. And uh, it hasn't grown much since then. It's got the RV campground. It's got one or two restaurants, a hotel, and the Sacred Heart Catholic Church. And one of the things I noticed when I first went out to Olima 24 years ago to tell stories was the church had a bell tower, but there was no bell inside. And I thought, well, that's peculiar. And being a curious sort, I, I, I started asking questions. And I found out that, well, indeed, there used to be a bell in the bell tower. It was long ago when the church was first built. And it was an elderly man's job to do the groundwork and the maintenance of the church and on Sunday mornings to ring the bell. And so he would climb up the spiral staircase up to the tower. And there was a ladder there. And he'd climb up the ladder, grab hold of the bell, bring it back, and give it a shove, and step out of, out of the way, right, so that it would ring. Ding, ding. And when the bell rang, everybody knew it was time to come to church on Sunday morning. But as the man got older, his arthritic knees made it hard for him to climb up the stairs. So they hired a young apprentice, a boy, vigorous, enthusiastic. And on Sunday mornings, when it was time to ring the bell, he ran up those stairs, scampered up the ladder, up to the platform, and grabbed hold of the bell. And he wanted to make a good impression. So he brought that bell back, and he gave it a mighty shove. Whoa, whoa, whoa. He lost his balance, and he teetered back and forth up on the platform and fell down, down, down. Bam! He hit the ground. And he hit the ground with such force that the earth shook. People thought it was an earthquake, and they came out of their homes to see what had happened. And there's the boy laying at the base of the bell tower. So he says, Doc, come quick, it's an emergency. And the doctor comes, and the first thing he does is to check for a pulse. I'm sorry, there, there's nothing I can do. The boy has died. So he says, well, Doc, who is it? The doctor looks, and he says, I'm not sure. That face just doesn't ring a bell. Oh. <laughs> what? Oh. Well, now they had a dilemma. They still needed somebody to ring the bell on Sunday mornings. So they hired another boy, the one with a little more self-control. And on Sunday mornings, when it was time to ring the bell, he walked up that staircase, held on to the railing. He was careful. And when he got to the ladder, it was one step at a time up to the platform. And when he got there, he grabbed hold of the bell, and he remembered what had happened to the other guy. So he brought it back just right and gave it a little shove. It swung out perfectly. Ding! And he stood there admiring his work. <laughs> and the bell swung back. Boom! Whoa! Whoa! Whoa, he loses his balance, and he falls down, 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 and bam, he hits the ground. Somebody calls out, Doc, come quick. It's happened again. And the doctor comes, and first thing he does is check for a pulse, right? <coughs> I'm sorry. Nothing I can do. This boy has died. <coughs> Somebody says, well, Doc, who is it? Doctor looks. And I'm not sure. But he's a dead ringer for the other guy. <laughs> so you can go to the town of Olima. And you'll find the Sacred Heart Catholic Church. It's right there next to the campground. And you'll see the bell tower. And there's no bell in it. The good folks of Olima, they took it down. They put it in the parking lot. 
because they couldn't find another ding-a-ling <laughs> to ring that bell. <laughs> So that's the story. So here's the song that goes with it. You ready? You're a brave group. You're going to listen to me sing. This is, takes a lot of courage. Excuse me, is there a Mary or a Jose Gonzalez in the world? Yes. You've got an overdue book. You're in trouble. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. You want to come? There's some important things. All right. All right. Sorry you're going to miss this. I am too. <laughs> <laughs> Alright, you ready? When I was an itty bitty boy, my grandmother gave me the cutest toy. Silver bells hanging on a string said it was my ding a ling a ling. My ding a ling, my ding a ling. Thought it was my ding a ling a ling. My ding a ling, my ding a ling. My, 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 my ding-a-ling. Then Mama took me to grammar school, but I stopped off in the vestibule. Every time that bell would ring, catch me playing with my ding-a-ling-a-ling. -a -ling. My ding-a-ling, my ding-a-ling. Caught me playing with my ding-a-ling. My ding-a-ling, my ding-a-ling. Caught me playing with my ding-a-ling-a-ling. Once I was climbing the garden wall, slipped and had a terrible fall. Fell so hard, heard bells ring, but I held on to my ding-a-ling-a-ling. My ding-a-ling, my ding-a-ling, I held on to my ding-a-ling. My ding-a-ling, my ding-a-ling, I held on to my ding-a-ling-a-ling. Once Swimming across Turtle Creek, man, them snappers all around my feet. Sure was hard crossing that thing with both hands holding my ding a ling a ling. My ding a ling, my ding a ling, both hands holding my ding a ling a ling. My ding a ling, my ding a ling, both hands holding my ding a ling a ling. Now, Chuck Berry recorded that song, 1972. It came out when I was a senior in high school. Chuck Berry, if there was a Mount Rushmore for rock and roll, would have his face engraved in stone. He wrote some amazing songs. He wrote Johnny Be Good and Maybelline and my favorite, Roll Over Beethoven, a quintessential rock and roll song. But the only number one hit the great Chuck Berry ever had. The only song that made it to the top of the charts was a novelty song that he didn't even write, My Ding-a-Ling. <laughs> and so I wrote this last verse in honor of Mr. Chuck Berry. This little song was a number one hit. It was Chuck Berry's most famous bit. Yeah, he's the man who wrote Maybelline. And now he's singing about a ding-a-ling-a-ling, -a his ding-a-ling, his ding-a-ling. Now he's singing about his ding-a-ling, his ding-a-ling, his ding-a-ling. Now he's singing about his ding-a-ling-a-ling. And that's how I do radio, stories and songs. <laughs> Okay, but this is the historical society. You want something grounded in truth, don't you? You want facts, right? Yes. Okay, all right, I can do that too. I can branch out. So here's a true story for you. Now when I first heard this story, I did not believe it, and you probably won't either. And based on what I've done so far, you probably don't trust me a whole lot. And that's okay. It's all right. We can work through this. I first heard this story when I was doing uh, radio at KHSU. Part of my job was to record news bits. And uh, Tish Carney would do the news on Fridays. And I would record her on uh, Wednesday afternoons. And she had a little thing she called short but sweet. Little tidbits of news. Welcome back.
we missed the singing, so we're, we're happy. Well, <laughs> <laughs> Let's go, everybody. I, I think people would be in concert with you to say you didn't miss a thing. Oh, what song was it? My ding away. Oh, jeez. Uh, because it goes with, you know, the... Yeah, the, I know. You know. <laughs> All right, so, so Tish Tullock tells me, she's a news reporter, right? She says, you know, I heard you're a storyteller, and I've heard you telling some stories on the radio, and you should tell some local lore, some true stories from the North Coast. He goes, she goes, have you ever heard about Captain Courageous? Oh. I said, I have no idea what you're talking about. And she told me that there was some, some sort of cow or something that floated down the river during the flood of 1964. Yeah. And I said, really? <laughs> and this is a true story that you want me to tell people. It sounds like a tall tale to me. She says, no, it's really how I don't know much about it, but it really happened. So I ventured over to the Historical Society, and I started doing my research. And I found out that there was indeed a true story involving the flood of 1964. I went up to Crescent City to the museum there and did a little research there. Even went to the town of Klamath and found a little information there. I did my homework on this one. And I started thinking about it as I was researching it, all these famous bovines in history and where Captain Courageous might fit in. Now the very first one I thought of was the cow that jumped over the moon, right? I mean, what a remarkable feat. Uh, it's a good, there's a good chance that, that it happened a long time ago and the moon maybe was a little closer to the earth. But still, I mean, an Olympian feet jumping over the moon. Then there's O'Leary's cow that allegedly kicked over the lantern that started the great Chicago fire, right? Although that's not really true. And as long as we're going to be factual here, the cow did not start that fire, but it got blamed for it. Easy, right, to blame a cow for a human error. So those are pretty insignificant. And then I thought about Elsie the cow, right? Her face was emblazoned on the Borden's milk products. I saw her every morning when I poured milk over my cereal. Elsie the cow. And besides, my mother's name was Elsie. Wow, that's pretty cool. I'd probably put Elsie in there. Who else? Oh, Ferdinand the bull. Yeah. Great story from my childhood, a, a peaceful bull who refused to fight. I love that story. I put him in there. And from local, the local area, Challenger's Joyce, the top milking cow in 1964 in all of the United States, right here in Ferndale. Challenger's Joyce is in. What else? Can you think of any other famous cows? Oh, Chloe, right? The great punster for a clover milk. She's goes in, right? If Elsie's in, so is Chloe. Can you think of any other famous cows, Daniel. steers? Daniel, yeah. Daniel, the, the, right, he's like the, isn't he like the heaviest one? Yes. Tall. Tallest. 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 Mm -hmm. How tall? Five or six feet. Oh. He's, he's six. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'll have to check out Daniel. I did see the thing in the paper. Lost, Lost Coast Hay having. Lost Coast Hay? Yeah. Okay, I will, I will check him out and see if he warrants induction into my <laughs> Hall of Fame. Can you think of any others? All right, well, after this story, I think you'll have one more that you'll add. Now, this, this story begins in December of 1964, when it was the rainiest month in the recorded history of Humboldt County. More rain fell in the month of December than we usually get annually, and it rained almost every single day. And a variety of storms. Some were cold and left snow on the hilltops and the mountains, and others were warmer and brought fierce winds and high tides and high, high currents and oceans and a ton of rain. It just poured and poured. The ground got saturated. It rained so much. It was like a washcloth in the bathtub. It just couldn't hold any more water. It just ran down the hillsides. They began to wash away shrubs and trees, filling up the rivers with not only water, but debris and the levels kept rising and rising. And the fiercest storm of all hit on December 21st. And it just poured, and the water had nowhere to go. And the tides were high, the runoff couldn't go anywhere, and it just backed up. The Klamath River, 15 feet over flood stage. The Eel River, 22 feet over flood stage. 22 feet! 
And this mass of water flows over the fields. It washed away people's homes and businesses, automobiles, and thousands of head of cattle washed out to sea. It was devastating. All the roads were blocked. People couldn't leave Humboldt County, and supplies couldn't come in. And the rain wouldn't stop. It didn't stop until Christmas Eve. And a man by the name of Dave Stewart, he lived up in Crescent City, he went down to the harbor to see what had happened during the storm. And there was so much debris in the harbor that Mr. Stewart could actually walk on top of it and not sink into the bay. And about 200 feet out in the debris, he saw something moving. And he went over there, and what he saw was a two-year-old steer trying to keep its head above water, struggling to stay alive. And Stuart looked down and said, holy cow, <laughs> how did you get here? <clears throat> well, he enlisted the help from eight other people, and they were able to lift Bahamas out of the water. And gradually, they were able to get him onto shore. He could barely walk, he could barely hold his own weight, he was exhausted. And when they got him into the house, yep, they brought him in the house, because he was shivering from the cold. They put him by the, the wood belly stove, right? And they warmed him up and they called for a vet. And the vet came and checked him out. He had no broken bones. He was a little beat up and a case of pneumonia. So they gave him antibiotics and they kicked in. And in about two, three days, he could stand on his own. And now the people who had lost so much in that region were enamored with this steer who had survived the flood of 64. And so they took his picture and they put it in the newspaper and said, Captain Courageous. And a family that lives at Klamath Glen sees the picture in the newspaper and went, that's our Bahamas. How did he get to Crescent City? When the storm started, he was in the pasture right here by the Klamath River. So they went up Crescent City, and sure enough, it was their beloved Bahamas. He got swept off the banks of the Klamath River into the river on a flotilla of debris and traveled right down the river steering clear of the bridge and boulders and all the other obstacles out into the Pacific Ocean, where he bobbed up and down on waves 30 feet high and all the way to Crescent City. I can just picture him standing on a, on a redwood plank. Cowabunga, dude! <laughs> right in those waves, right? Well, people became so infatuated with the story of Captain Courageous, his three-day journey in the Pacific Ocean, that they used him as, as a sort of a, an inspiration to, to rebuild their towns. The town of Klamath was completely washed away. And as they rebuilt that town, they, they brought Bahamas back to town, and they put him in a pasture. He had his own pasture in downtown Klamath. And he lived there until he was 20 years old. People would come and feed him apples and, and give him sugar cubes and things like that and tell stories about his famous journey down the Klamath River and surfing the Pacific Ocean. So I'm thinking, out of all the cows and steers in history, there's nobody's got a better story than Captain Courageous. And so he's my first choice for my bovine hall of fame. And I know you're going to sit there and go, uh-huh, sure, yeah, yeah, you, this is the guy that told us that Blue Wet Lake flew away with some birds. But I can verify this story. I got proof. E. Clampus Vitus. They put up a plaque in Klamath right next to his pasture. You can go there and see that plaque. I did. And it says, Captain Courageous, 1963 to 1983. The heroic voyage of this crossbred steer floating downriver from Klamath Glen and up the coast to Crescent City Harbor was an inspiration to the flood victims of Klamath. He embodied their courage, stamina, and an indomitable spirit. A living memorial to the disastrous flood of 64, he passed peacefully on to greener pastures in 1983. Erected May 10th, 1997, by E. Clampus Vitus, Eureka Chapter 101, in memory of Andy Macbeth, the captain's final caretaker.
True story, Captain Courageous and the Flood of 64. I told you I could tell the truth. <laughs> Do you believe me? Some of you don't. I can tell. <laughs> tell. All right, it's okay. So is, are you, is this the sort of thing you want? Am I doing all right? Am, okay, it's hard to know. This is, uh, we're on We Outland, and this is a Native American tale that I heard when I came here. It's uh, one of those tales that's kind of universal. It's also told in Scandinavian countries, in Eastern Europe and everything. It's one of those tales that has meaning to every culture, no matter whose culture is telling it. And this is a, a, my adapted version of this tale. And it's about a little bird who is struggling to fly south for the winter. He has clipped a branch while he was flying and his wing is broken and he's on the forest floor and he, he can't get off the ground and all the other birds are going to leave him behind and well, he knows that he's in peril on the ground. Predators will easily catch him. And he can't fly south so he needs shelter to keep warm and, and so he hops around the forest floor asking trees to help him for their protection. Right? Pete. Peep, hello alder tree, will you help me? I've broken my wing and I can't fly south. And the alder tree stands and says, Oh, I've got to fend for myself. Winter's hard, little bird. I've got to take care of myself. You've got to do the same. Okay, thanks anyways. And the little bird hopped along and, until he came to a maple tree. Hello, maple tree, will you help me? I've broken my wing and I can't fly south for the winter. And the maple tree says, I've got squirrels and chipmunks all over me. I, I don't have any space for any more. You've got to go somewhere else for help. Okay, thanks anyways. And the little bird hops along, peep, 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 and comes up to an oak tree. Oak tree, will you help me? I, I've broken my wing and I can't fly south for the winter. And the oak tree says, oh, I'm way too busy. I, I've got acorns to make, lots and lots of acorns to make. That's my job. Somebody else will have to help you. OK, thanks anyways. And just then, a, a spruce tree with its swooping boughs scooped up the little bird and placed it up in the higher branches. I said, little bird, you can stay with me. You can live here and you can eat the seeds and the insects off my bark. And pine tree, when the wind is blowing, that north wind blowing, chilled and cold, would you block it and protect our little friend? And pine tree says, you bet. And fir tree, when the sun is out, would you just bend a little to the side and let the rays of sunlight keep our little friend warm? Of course I will. And so that winter, that little bird, it lived in the branches of that spruce tree. And the pine blocked the wind and the fir let in the sunlight. And that bird was able to survive the winter. And come springtime, it was able to fly away. And as it flew off, it said, thank you, spruce. Thank you, fir. Thank you, pine. You saved me. And Mother Nature had observed all of this as it was unfolding and saw how selfish the alder and the maple and the oak were, but how helpful the evergreens were. And she decided to teach the selfish trees a lesson. And so every fall, those trees, they lose their leaves. They're naked. And they stand in the forest just that way, exposed to all the elements. So they would know what that little bird would have gone through had it not been for the lovely evergreens. And that story is called The Evergreens. So that's a variety of stories from here, right? You, you've heard a true story, you've heard a legend, a legend that's kind of universal. I love that that story is told not only here, 
by Native Americans and, and a Caucasian, but also in Eastern Europe and in Scandinavian countries. I just think that's amazing. I, I just love the universality of, of that story, you know? So let's do something else, a little, a little something different. This is another true story. This is a story that uh, I first heard uh, my friend Dan O'Garrett tell. <coughs> Dan was the founder of the North Coast Storytellers here in Humboldt County, and I was one of his first recruits. And when I moved up here, I met Dan. Uh, everybody t said, oh, you're a storyteller. Do you know Dan O'Gara? <laughs> and I said, I do now. I do now. So I met Dan, and, and uh, he used to tell this story. And I, I also found it in a, in a collection of Hector Lee, uh, Tales of California, a wonderful book didn't have all the facts right, but it's a great story. And so this is the version that I know. Now, in Humboldt County, there's lots of places that don't exist anymore, right? There's little towns and villages, some washed away in the flood, some were abandoned when the logging operations ceased to exist. And there is a, a little town just southeast of Trinidad that is also a, a missing town, a town that no longer exists. A natural disaster took that away. It's a town where, where there's nobody around that remembers it anymore. And all the people that once lived there, they're all gone. So there, there's nobody who can recollect the taste of pancakes at the cookhouse. There's nobody that remembers the smell of Mrs. Abbott's flowers in her garden. And there's nobody that remembers the sound of the train whistle coming through the woods. They're all gone now. And so is the town. And this is the story of what happened to Luffenholz. It was in the summer of 1908, 110 years ago. And Charlie Devander and John Atwell they were operating the train that ran from Eureka to Trinidad. It would leave in the morning and bring people up to Trinidad and back down to Eureka in the evening. It made two trips. And there were two trains. One went from the north and one went from the south. And they used Luffenholz, a little town of about 30 families, as the place to pass one another. There was a side rail. And so the, the train going south would take the side rail so that the one coming up north could pass. And then the one on the south would get back on and head on down to Eureka. It was a routine they had worked out. And on this summer day, Charlie and John had heard that a fire had broke out, a wildfire in the woods. And they were concerned. They were concerned about whether the trestle would burn in Luffenholz. They were able to get back to Eureka. They were concerned about the people that lived in Luffenholz, about 60 of them. And they started off that day, and John's throwing the fuel in, and Charlie's blowing the whistle. Everybody knows the train's on its way. And as they travel down the tracks going towards Luffenholz, they can see the smoke from the fire. And they can see flames dancing from treetop to treetop. And now they were even more concerned. What will the people in Luffenholz do? How will they protect themselves? It was their job to get them out of there. And so they headed towards Luffenholz. And when they got to the town, well, there was flames everywhere. The town was engulfed in flames, and the people were gone. And Charlie stood there for a moment and thought, we got three choices. We can back up and go back to Trinidad and be safe. We can keep going forward and hope the trestle's still holding up and we don't run into the northbound train and get out of here. Or we could wait and see that the people are safe. They chose the third option. They figured the folks probably had headed towards the ocean to get away from the flames. But they'd blow that whistle and they'd wait as long as they could and give them a chance to come and be rescued on the train. And so Charlie's pulling on that whistle. And suddenly people come running out of the woods. Sure enough, they'd gone down to the ocean, but the fire had encircled them. They were trapped. They couldn't get to the water. 
So now they come running back. They hear the whistle of the train. It's salvation. They'll get on that train. And as they board the train, fire breaks out behind them. There's no going back now. They've got to go forward. That's the only direction they can go. But what if the northbound train is coming? What if the flames have burned the trestle? They had no choice. They moved off the sidetrack onto the main. John loaded up the fuel, and Charlie blowing that whistle, and opening up the throttle. And the train starts heading down those tracks. The flames are whipping around them. It's bubbling the paint on the side of the train. People are huddled together, their jackets pulled over the head so that their hair won't catch on fire. People's skin were blistering from the heat. The flames were so intense. And the smoke was so thick that Charlie couldn't see the tracks in front of him. It was all on faith. Now, we're just forging ahead, open up that throttle, blow that horn, and pray. Let's pray that we get to the other side. And that train rumbled down the track. And 10 miles later, it broke into the clearing. They'd gotten out of the fire. They looked back, and the hillsides were ablaze. But they had made it. They'd gotten through, and not one single person had perished. Oh, there's some burnt skin here and there, but nobody had died. He'd saved everybody in town. And that northbound train, a tree fell in Arcata on the tracks, a giant redwood tree, and it blocked the passage for the northbound train. Fate was shining on them that day. All those people survived, but not the town of Leffenholz. It was burned to the ground. There's nothing left of it. And all the people that once lived there, they've long since passed away. All we have left from Muffin Holtz is the name of the beach and the park and this story of the last train from Muffin Holtz. At least another 15 minutes. At least another, okay. Can you endure another 15 minutes? Sure. More if you want it, but I think they kick us out at three. Well, we won't be here that long. Will we? No, I know. So, um, I was just going to tell you, too, uh, Captain Courageous, the story. Um, there was a book written, Harriet Weaver. She was a one of the first uh, female park rangers in uh, California. And she wrote a book called Beloved Was Bahamas, A Steer to Remember. She, I'm not the only one that uses puns. It's a wonderful story. It's fictitious. Um, it takes a real life event, and, and she builds drama about uh, giving characters and names to people and everything. Not all of them are real, but it's a wonderful story. So if that's, that particular tale piqued your interest, there's another way to Check it out, and I believe they have this in the library. I'm pretty sure they used to, anyways. And if not, I, I'll sell you my copy. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. And the other thing I wanted to tell you too, um, I teach storytelling through Ollie. I've been doing some programs. You're a victim of one of my classes, and a survivor, actually. You survived it. And, and uh, I've got one coming up, and it's called Strange Things Done: Local Lore. And what I'll do is, a, a part of the class will be, I will tell some stories, but the other part of it is I'm going to teach people, I'm going to give a little tutorial on, on how to create the stories, how to take real life things like the Leffenholtz train or Captain Courageous and turn it into a story, right? to, to give it a format for being told. So that's the, the class, what I'm going to offer, it's uh, on July 26th and it's a uh, Thursday morning, and it's through Ollie. So, so it's an opportunity to hear more local lore and some, some different stories than what I've told here. And maybe one or two the same, but some different ones definitely. And then to, to put together a story, we'll actually take a uh, real life event and we will in class together turn it into a story. So we'll use the elements of a story and we'll create a story out of that thing. So for example, uh, Bigfoot, right? The lore of Bigfoot, that's 
prevalent. It's everywhere, right? So, you know, if, you, if we were to take that as an example, we would gather research and maybe some anecdotal evidence, some physical evidence, some stories that other people have told, and then figure out what story are we going to tell with all this information. That's how the class will work. That won't be the story, but that's the idea. So that, that we take some knowledge that we have, some information, and I'll bring most of that, and people will add what they know, and then we'll try and formulate a story. We'll take and put it together so that you go home with something to tell. Because that's what folklore is all about. That's why we do this. We share these stories and it perpetuates who and what we are, right? And a little bit about our history, right? So there is, what, why do you think Bigfoot's a big deal in Humboldt County? Any, any thought? You know, if stories represent a little bit about who and what we are as people, what, what role does Bigfoot play in our community? Yeah. Well, I would say that there's all kinds of wide open places, you know, that are kind of spooky if you're out there by yourself and we have large animals that have been in the woods in the past. And uh, so, you know, maybe there's just kind of uh, a way of explaining some of the things that you think you heard or right. you might have saw or mm -hmm. you saw or, you know. A big culture of out outdoorsy people here, right? Yeah. They spend a lot of time out in the woods, whether they were logging or fishing or hunting, you know. So yeah, things happen, can't explain it, so you find an explanation, right? That's certainly one. Can you think of any others? It's just on the map. Well, it gives, yeah, okay, so it gives us something unique, right? It's our version of a, a Paul Bunyan kind of thing, right? We've, we've got Bigfoot. You, in Maine, you got Paul Bunyan. Minnesota, you got Paul Bunyan. We got Bigfoot, yeah. Yeah, that's cool, right? What else? What, I mean, why Bigfoot? Wasn't it a Native American legend? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, he's also in that, right? Sasquatch, right? Yeah, yeah. so it, it's rooted in this area, right? So there, it's a connection to that, absolutely. Well, isn't everything around here kind of big? Right? I mean, the trees are enormous, right? There's big rivers, big ocean out there. Things are big, right? And if you're going to tell a tall tale, right, that identifies your region, you want something big, right? Like Bigfoot, right? I mean, that's part of it. I also heard a story told, okay? So this is how this kind of thing works. I also heard a story told once about some people who were harvesting marijuana. An unusual thing to do around here, I know. And, and it was illegal back then, so I probably shouldn't name names. But they wanted all the attention diverted somewhere else for their little endeavor. It was harvest time, and they didn't want anybody to notice. So they went out and put gigantic footprints in sandbars up near Tishtang. <laughs> and there was all sorts of people poking around up there trying to figure out what left those footprints. It was Bigfoot. Yes, it was Bigfoot. Look for Bigfoot, because we're harvesting our marijuana. Right here. <laughs> so that, that's another part. That, so that's how storytelling works, right? And you collect these sort of things. There's factual parts of it. There's historical parts of it. There's legendary cultural things. And then there's just the folklore, right, and the nonsense. And from that, you create a story and a cultural identity, OK? So there's more to that, but that's what my class is going to do. And we'll look at an item, not Bigfoot, but something like that. And we will create a story. OK, so much for advertising. That's, now it's story time. Story time. <laughs> I'm going to do. Uh, Do this one. Fifth grade girl in elementary school. Class assignment. They're studying the gold rush. And they got to do a report on the gold rush, the California gold rush. So she goes home and it's supper time, and that's when the family swaps stories and what they did during the day. And she says, Guess what? I got to do a report on the California gold rush. And her grandfather was sitting at the table and she says, you know, sweetheart, I used to be a prospector up on the Trinity River. I used to pan for gold. 
I can actually show you firsthand how it's done. Would you like that? That would be wonderful. I'll go. Mom, Dad, can I go with Grandpa? Sure, honey. Sounds great. And so they plan a trip. They're going to go spend a weekend up on the Trinity River, and he's going to show her how to pan for gold and how he found the pockets that looked like they might contain gold. So they got a mule. They're going to do it old school, right? They got a mule, and they got all the camping gear and the gold mining gear, and they loaded up the mule, and they headed on up to the Trinity River. And they, they stopped uh, just, a little, just a little outside of Wolf Creek. And they hiked in Hawkins Bar down to the river. And they're both walking along, and, and they get down to the river, and he says, OK, I'm going to put you up on the mule, and I'll lead the way. And they're going along the river, and they come by a campsite, and the old guy says, that's ridiculous, that poor old man having to walk like that. He said, a young girl sitting there, she should be leading the mule. She's strong, young, save his strength. He should ride. When she heard that, she felt horrible. She didn't even think of the imposition she put on her grandfather. So she says, Grandpa, let's switch places. I'll walk for a while. So they, they switch places. And she's now leading the burrow, and he's riding the back. <coughs> and they come by the next campsite, and somebody says, this is ridiculous. That old man's making a little girl do all the work. <laughs> and she's not strong enough to hold a mule like that. That's absurd. Well, now he felt horrible. I thought, well, OK, let's both ride. Come on up here. And he gets his granddaughter up there, and he takes the reins, and yeah, and they're going along, and they come by the next campsite. So he says, that poor mule, having to do all that work, carrying both those people and all that gear, it's going to break his back. How cruel. I'm going to call PETA. <laughs> <laughs> now they felt horrible. So they got off, and they're both walking along. And, and finally, they come to the spot in the river and says, there it is. There's my spot right there. But we got to cross the river. Do you know how to swim? She says, oh, Grandpa, I swim really well. Watch, you see. And she dives into the river. She swims across to the other side. It's easy, Grandpa. It's great. Good job. I'm proud of you. And now he leads the mule in. He says, OK, get on out. Go on. Wax it across the backside. Yeah, get across. And then he dives in, and he swims across. And when he gets to the other side, his granddaughter's frantic. Grandpa, Grandpa, look, look, the mule. It's drifting downstream. He goes, oh, no, it's got everything on the back. What are we going to do, Grandpa? There's nothing we can do. But we can learn a valuable lesson from this. Well, what's that? You try and please everybody? and you lose your ass. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty much a true story, I think. <laughs> Had you heard that one before, John? <laughs> You've heard me tell stories a lot of times, and you hadn't heard that one? Yeah. Hey, did you make that one up, Paul? Of course not. It, it happened just like I said. <laughs> it's exactly how it unfolded. Yeah. You, you want to hear another? Yes. You doing all right? Yeah. Oh, I know why a lot of you are here. You're getting out of doing chores, aren't you? <laughs> if you had to go home, you'd have to be working in the garden or doing something like that. I get it now. All right, this, this is a, uh, when I first came to Humboldt County, I, I had a lot of misfortune. I, I, have, I don't have really, really bad, bad luck, but I have lots of uh, things go wrong. Right? For example, I, I play senior softball. I've got a couple of my colleagues here today. I play senior softball, right? And I got involved in the, in the politics of it. I got on the board, right? And my wife said, I don't want you getting in, you play but don't get involved you always get involved you always join things and then you are on the board and doing stuff not this time you just play softball you got to devote your time to other things we got projects at home that need your attention so okay I, I, I won't join the board 
go to the board meeting, they go, Paul, we need you to be the commissioner. I said, Ooh. I can't. I can't. I promised my wife I wouldn't join the board. I did it last year, but I didn't tell her. So I was vice president the year before, and I didn't tell her, and I got away with it. She never found out. And I said, I, I can't push my life. I'm the commissioner. She'll find out because everybody's going to call me about stuff. I can't do it. And they say, okay, and they vote for somebody else. And that person ends up resigning. And I'm at the board meeting, and they go, Paul, we don't have a commissioner. We need you. Well, any altruistic person hears that and says, I'm needed. They respond to the call, don't they? And I said, sure, I'll be the commissioner. I will help. So I'm doing it for a couple of months. She doesn't know. I'm getting away with it again. This is amazing. I've gone 18 months serving on the board, and she doesn't even know about it. And then we get contacted by the senior news. And they need an article for the paper about our softball league. So I write a story about one of the players. His name is Jack McHenry. And I wrote up a little story, and they put it in there. And they said, so you know, what's your affiliation? And I said, well, I, I play softball in the league, and, and I'm the commissioner. So they put the article in the senior news. And at the end of the article, it says, Dave Woodland player and commissioner of the Senior Softball Association. My wife gets the senior news and reads the story. She goes, you did a really nice job. But they gave credit to Dave Woodland. Who's Dave Woodland? I said, oh, they just made a mistake. She goes, well, did they make a mistake too in saying that you're the commissioner? Oops. <laughs> Busted. <laughs> she didn't talk to me for three days. <laughs> three days. That's what happens when she gets mad at me. She doesn't talk to me. So that's why I went to see Tom Jones on Tuesday, right? I told you, I'm good now. I squared that one up. <laughs> so good to see Tom Jones, right? That. Yeah, I fixed that one. But that sort of thing just happens to me, right? It's not a major thing, right? It's, it's one of those this little things where I miscalculate uh, what the right thing to do is, you know? And, and so this story is kind of like that. You see, the devil is visiting Arcata. And he spent the whole afternoon on the plaza of Arcata making deals, right? He made a lot of deals that day. He had some real bargains. He, he, he harvested a lot of souls that day. And at the end of his day, he was tired, and he goes into the alibi for some refreshments. And he pulls up a bar stool, and he's sitting at the bar, and all these guys hanging around, kind of like me, commiserating, right, about their hard luck. You know? There's a student in there, and he sits, yeah, you know, I was taking this chemistry class, and you know, I have my student loans, and my student loans are predicated on my GPA, and my chemistry professor put in the wrong grade. I got an A, but he put in an F, and my GPA went down, and I've lost my student loans, and it wasn't even my fault. Oh, that's bad luck. That's terrible. Somebody else said, oh, man, I was, I was just parked, just parked, and some guy plowed right into my car. I just bought it. It was brand new. And the insurance isn't even going to replace it. It says that it's used now. I just bought it. They won't give me full value. Well, wow, that's hard luck. The devil says, oh, ain't nothing. That ain't nothing. You want to know hard luck? You should hear my story. So what do you mean? You don't do anything good. You're not a good person at all. Because that's my point. Everybody thinks I'm this evil deal. He goes, I demonstrate what I mean. I want you to meet me tomorrow at the Arcata Community Forest. And I will demonstrate exactly what I mean. Life is not fair. So, curious. They all get up early. They meet out at the Community Forest, 10 a.m. The devil's there. He's got a bag of gold. He says, I've brought this bag of gold, and I wish to disseminate it to anybody who walks along this path. But in order to do it, I will need God's help. God, 
Would you place a boulder on this path for me so that I can spread this gold out on top of it? God was skeptical, as you might imagine. But he was curious how this might play out, so a boulder appears on the pathway. And the devil, true to his word, placed the bag of gold on top. He said, now come with me. And they went and hid behind some rhododendrons. And they waited for people to hide past, to see what would happen. And right off the bat, a, a college student, a young lady, she's walking barefoot up the path. And she's looking up at the trees and the birds, not paying any attention to where she's going. And she walks along and bam, hits her toe on that boulder. And you know when you slam your toe like that, your eyes just kind of water up, right? It's not like you're crying or anything. It's just sort of a reflex thing. And, and the tears just welled up in her eyes. And she said, who the devil put that there? What devil would do such a thing? And she limped away, and, and the fluids in her eye kept her from seeing the bag of gold on the rock. A little while later, a, a young man comes out of the woods, and he's disheveled and dirty. And he stops and, and drops to his knees and says, Oh, please, God, I'm so hungry, I haven't eaten for days. Please help me. And when he stood back up, he saw the bag on the rock. He went over to see what it was, and he looked in, and it was filled with gold. He says, praise the Lord, thank you, God, you saved me. And he took the bag of gold, and he headed into town. And the devil turned to look at all his comrades, and he said, you see what I mean? God put the boulder in the path, and I got blamed for it. <laughs> I put the gold on the rock. And God gets all the credit. <laughs> Life just isn't fair. <laughs> yeah, it can be that way sometimes, right? Shall we do one more? You, you got enough stamina for one more? Yeah. All right. So do you want, uh, do you want a true story? I would. Not that any of these were lies. <laughs> <laughs> All right, this, this is one of my favorites. So when I came up to Humboldt County, I told you I came up in, uh, in 1996. I was a park ranger at Lake Sonoma. And I was working in a stay in school program. As long as I uh, was in school and kept up my grade point average, I could have this job as a park ranger. And I would work full time during the summer when school was out and part time during the school year. So on Friday afternoons when I got out of my botany lab, I would pack the car, get my ranger uniform and my school books and the change of clothes and everything and I'd head on down to Lake Sonoma, about three and a half hours down to Cloverdale. I'd stay with one of my coworkers and I'd work Saturday and Sunday. Six o'clock on Sunday evening, I'd pack the car back up again and drive three and a half hours back to Arcata so that I could go to class at eight o'clock the next morning. And that first semester nearly did me in. It was taxing, driving back and forth. But that wasn't the real problem. I had this class called ornithology. And ornithology is the study of birds. Now, a practical course for a park ranger, but a lot of memorization. And we studied the skeletal system, the feathering, the difference between a male, a female, a mature and immature, the songs of birds. I mean, there's so much to learn. But I was doing well. I was motivated. Because when you're a park ranger, people come up to you all the time and go, I saw a bird in a tree. What was it? <laughs> and it's good to know, right? or at least be able to make up names, right? <laughs> and I had a whole list of names now, so I was doing really well. So I saw the value of this class. It was a practical application for my career choice. So I studied hard, I memorized well, and I was getting A's on all the tests. And then comes time for the final exam. And it was on a Monday morning, and I had just driven back 
from park rangering all weekend long. I was exhausted. I stayed up, studied a little bit, refreshed my memory. I didn't get much sleep. And I go in there at 8 o'clock in the morning, and, and it's, a, it's a big classroom. And it's kind of bowl-shaped. And the professor's down here, and we're all here. So I take my seat, and everybody's filing in. And I, I'm sleepy, a little groggy. I didn't drink coffee back then, and I was, you know, come on, Paul, you can do it. Come on. Professor walks in, and he hands out the exam. And it's a piece of paper numbered 1 through 10, and each number has two lines. And he says, this exam, you are to identify the 10 birds you see in front of you. And in front of us were 10 birds mounted on a table, and they all had a, a gunny sack over them. He said, each bird, scientific name, and its common name. When you finish the exam, put your name in the right-hand corner, place it on my desk, and I'll see some of you next semester. <laughs> I said, not me. I'm going to pass this exam. So I looked down at all the birds, and all you could see hanging down was the legs and the feet. He'd left the bags on the birds. So, you know, I'm, I'm bold. I raised my hand. Excuse me, professor. <laughs> I forgot to take the bags off the birds. We can't see what they are. He stands up and he says, you know, we've been studying birds all semester long. We've studied every aspect of birds. Their feathering, their skeletal system, their song. So you should know everything there is to know about birds. So I'm not going to take the bags off. You must identify these birds by their legs and their feet only. I didn't review that part of the exam. That didn't seem like a practical application to me, the legs and the feet. But then I thought, how hard can it be? Raptors have claws. I can probably figure that out. Ducks, they have web feet. I can differentiate that. I can do this. So I looked down at all the legs and feet. And they all look like Robin's feet. <laughs> Tiny, skinny. I couldn't differentiate. But I don't give up easily. I thought. The bags are shaped over the birds. They'll indicate what's inside if I just look carefully. Maybe I can even see through if they're porous enough. So I peer down, but it looked like a series of Tootsie Pops. I couldn't tell what was inside. I'm being tired and cranky. I just got a little frustrated, and I, I just got up. I walked down. I put my exam on the desk, and I headed out the door. The professor says, hold on. I said, what? So you didn't put your name on the paper. <laughs> you don't know who I am? Young man, I got 150 students in the class. How can I possibly differentiate you from all the others? <laughs> I said, well, perhaps this will help. And I hopped up on the table next to the birds, and I pulled up my pant legs. I says, now do you know who I am? <laughs> A lot of people ask me after I tell that story, what grade did you get in ornithology? And I like to answer it this way. I spent six years, I went through five jobs, four nature changes, three different homes, two girlfriends to get one degree in speech communication. <laughs> Well, thank you for listening. I do appreciate taking your uh, Saturday afternoon out. And uh, I guess if you have any questions for me, I'd be happy to answer questions. If you're curious about uh, anything I did today or why I do what I do or why they brought me in here in the first place. <laughs> no questions? Uh, I don't have a question, but I have a story that's kind of interesting about uh, the mountain lion up the redwood tree. Uh, yeah. The lady that saved her husband. Yeah. I think there's probably very few people that would believe that. 
That's for sure. You're right about that. Yeah, that's a that's a good idea. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Anything else? Yeah. Well, thanks a lot for coming out. I really appreciate it.